Okay. Last class on Eureka, right? <laughs> oh, the plane. Huh? Uh, yes, the group. We have the group. That's it. Um, Williams, do you mind closing all the windows? I <laughs> the planes are competing with me again. <laughs> Yep. No, that's it. Monday we have a group, and then boom, you are writing your essay, and that's it. Yep. I'm gonna miss you guys. <laughs> it was nice. Yep. <laughs> One. Can I ask after class how many I have? Yeah, yeah, you can. By the way, it's not recommended to miss this group. There's somebody. Was it you? <laughs> You missed the group and um, you wrote a good essay, but if you if we had talked before the essay, it would <laughs> exactly right. I know, I know. So because when you're in the group, you can check, right? You can like throw your ideas at me and be like, is this a good direction? I'll be like, yeah. But if we could have talked, then I'd be like, no, 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 you shouldn't need to talk about that. And then boom, you would have gotten an A, right? Because it was it, it was better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the writing was good, so it was, it was sad. Yeah, I was sad. <laughs> so okay, good. Um, all right, let's finish Irigaray. Let me, before I get into Irigaray, I mean, into the text, um, I want to go over a couple uh, questions one of you had. Um, it's interesting. I like what you, your questions. Yeah, you, I'm going to go with your two questions. <laughs> so, so she mentions, can we really, remember how we said how Irigaray says we have to become virgins again, right, before we enter the relationship with the other. She says it's possible because not something that someone can, it's not physical, right? True virginity is emotional. You can reclaim that always, right? Physically, whatever, right? But she says the real virginity is the ability to come without baggage. So she's asking, well, you know, is that even possible? Like if you've experienced something traumatic, can you just wipe the slate clean and be like you were before when you were before the trauma, right? So this is a really good question. And this is where you can criticize Yuri Gurai. Maybe the terminology is not that great, virginity, right? Because that implies that you can become, go back to this purity. Whereas if you go through some trauma, there are two paths ahead for you now and which we can still we can still go in the direction of irigari but with different concept usually when you go through some let's imagine it's like sexual trauma right how do you even you know forget that right you can never be the person you were before that but you can choose you can become either worse so there you have a lot of baggage trauma resentment and fear and so forth what you can also become is better <laughs> right um Anyone who's gone through trauma and then the process of forgiveness, which I think we talked about with Livinas, right? Do you remember? Uh, yes. I see dead faces, <laughs> dead eyes. <laughs> Everybody remembers the, the section on forgiveness that we talked about? Okay. Someone is hiding, Avila. <laughs> is hiding your ignorance right now, <laughs> we talked about. Okay. So... If you actually do that, you become better than a virgin. Let me explain. <laughs> There's a way to be better than a virgin, guys. <laughs> um, if we compare virginity to a source, right, that has been unopened, right? Let's imagine a, a, in the Song of Songs, it uses the image of a garden which is closed or a spring that is, you know, locked. This beautiful image, right? Once you've gone through trauma, obviously you've been open, you know, violently, but you can actually become an even deeper source when you go through trauma and you forgive because you've tapped into regions of love that you didn't even know you had. Like you are now trying to love this person and forgive them. And that takes resources that you don't have. <laughs> you have to go deeper. And you remember in the class on Kierkegaard, that's what we were talking about, right? Accessing a deeper layer of love, right? Kierkegaard speaks beautifully of the fact that there is a mundane way of loving we all have a little bit of love that we can give general love right this is a worldly love we all have a you know a quantity that we can offer but usually life will just deplete that very quickly right and now you start to hate right uh, or become resentful and Kierkegaard says there's actually a deeper layer that we can tap into of love which is in a way extraordinary love right or he calls it divine love where you then find the love to love that person or to at least forgive them right at that moment you are a, a spring which is not only unlocked but it's a spring that is welling up from a deeper source this is even better than the spring locked up you know what i mean it's a spring which has even accessed subterranean water so it's welling up even more powerfully than before and then, of course, you have a spring that's dried up and destroyed, right? So, so the virgin one is there's just a normal spring, locked. It's nice. 
But once it has been broken, you can actually become, if you choose the path of forgiveness, you can become an even uh, more powerful uh, because you have tapped into a deeper source. And so I, I wish she had gone more in that direction. I see what she's doing, right? She's trying, remember, she's reformulating all the concepts of patriarchy and giving them a new meaning, right? Because she believes you can't just get rid of that language, right? It's there. <laughs> it's, people are always going to talk about virginity and about man, woman, and about, you know, marriage and so forth. So she says, um, uh, and then uh, sexual difference and so forth. She says, we need to, we're going to keep the language, but we're going to reformulate it. We're going to transfigure the language so that it has a new meaning. That's her purpose, right? Which she's criticized for because people are saying, why are you staying with that language, right? She's saying, well, that's the language we have. People... That's the language that, right? So I'm working with what I have. I'm not trying to recreate a new reality, right? So that would be, so yeah, in a way you can criticize Irigra by saying, well, you can't, this virginity means clean slate. Can you really, is that really good <laughs> to go back to being naively, you know, what you were before? So I guess that would be my, my response to that. Um, second thing you said was with regards to the silence, what if there's issues we need to talk about? And here I am staying silent, <laughs> right? And again, people are like, right? Silence has been the, the language of women for centuries. We know this. You saw your mothers. You saw your grandmothers. Nobody's speaking, <laughs> right? And so here she is talking about silence. That's outrageous, right? But remember, for her, the silence, it's simply, silence, first of all, goes both ways, man and woman, right? So it's not like she's saying women be quiet. Um, but also silence is the prerequisite of communication. That's what she's saying. Silence opens the threshold for them language right so if you don't have silence first of all you're gonna talk <laughs> and there will be no communication silence actually opens the space for the other to speak before you speak that's all it is it's like you know how you open the door before someone yeah. right and you let them go in this is this is what silence does is here you go you speak first <laughs> and then i will respond and now i can respond to what you're saying so one other way to do it is when you're dealing with someone you can say i know where you're coming from i understand where you're coming from i know you're not trying to hurt me i understand who you are now here's what i have to say right um i had a, a beautiful moment like that um with somebody who had been pretty abusive in my life. And so one day when I was old enough to speak, which was in my 30s, <laughs> because before I couldn't speak, right? So in my 30s, I went with this person to a restaurant. I invited them. And I started like this. I said, I know you would never want to hurt me, which is true. Person is not mean, not cruel. Just they, they have violent temper, right? I said, I know you would never want to hurt me. But when you speak like that, it's me. It hurts me. Like I am sensitive in a way that what you're doing, I know you don't have the intention. It hurts me. It's all that person needed, right? Because if I had gone and said, you're hurting me and I, I, I needed to stop, they would have seen like, oh, she's accusing me of being hurtful and that's not who I am. And so now they can't listen to you. But if you start by saying, I know who you are. That's creating a space for them. I know, I know you would never want to do this, but here's the effect on me. Now that person feels, okay, I'm not a, I'm not a villain. <laughs> and now they're willing to listen. Do you, uh, Nasiri? I thought that was a hand. Okay, <laughs> okay, good. Does that make sense? So there are many ways, right? Um, she, she's all really teaching us to talk, right? To communicate. And the silence is the prerequisite. If I can create the space, is that a hand? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. What if I, what if there's a mirror you can always, um, it's, it's beautiful. I was just thinking this morning about that. I was reading some text on Levinas. You know how Levinas says the other is always vulnerable. I, I don't know if you remember. The other is always destitute, vulnerable. And we can be tempted to say, well, no. <laughs> the other sometimes is cruel. The other is uh, oppressor, right? And actually what, what I understood Levinas was saying is that deep down, the other is always vulnerable. The other is always destitute. Deep down, the other is always craving for love right? Even if they're Hitler, deep down, scratch a little bit, read the biography, not the one he wrote, <laughs> somebody else, right? Right? Scratch a little bit and you will always see that at their core, human beings are destitute. We are impoverished. We are longing for something we do not have, which is love. Does that make sense? So even that person is, is a complete, you know, you feel they're a complete lost cause, right? The silence where you pause and you create a space and you say, I know that there's still part of you <laughs> that doesn't want to do this and I'm speaking to that, that will change everything. Do you see what I mean? 
uh, Nasiri? You don't know what? <laughs> no, obviously, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> but if I had been Hitler's wife, I could have had that conversation, right? Because he is, right, I, or, you know, somebody close to him doesn't have to be his wife. If I had had a, a close connection, I could do that, right? And be like, you know, I know you don't, I know this isn't you. You, you know, why are you doing this? This isn't you. Um, so you can't obviously do that to a total stranger, right? Or to somebody who's about to shoot you in the face, right? Although sometimes, <laughs> right? I mean, sometimes it's true. We've seen, like, I don't know if you saw in movies, hostage situations where the person who is being hostage is, is you know, smooth talking, kind of, you know, talking in a very humane way to the person who has the gun. And that kind of does something to them, right? So that's the idea here that she's saying. And I love how living us, I finally understood that because me too, I struggled. Like I was like, well, not everyone is destitute. So does that mean only the people in the street who are, you know, hungry? So no, everyone deep down is destitute. And to connect to that part of the person is to connect authentically. Does that make sense? And so this silence, again, is, is not just verbal silence. It's just a pause on you to kind of open up a space for them and you can speak for them like I did with that person. I said, I know you wouldn't want to hurt me. That's something he would have told me, right? I know you wouldn't want to hurt me. But then, so I kind of opened a space for them or I was expressing who I thought they were, right? So, okay. So that was just a couple of things. Any questions or comments on that before I go? Um, okay. Uh, did you want to add anything? You're good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Um, so a couple, of, uh, let's just review briefly what we said last time. Uh, I want to add a couple of thoughts and then get into today moving boundaries and double listening. So we saw last time silence, right? Remember what we're doing, right? We, and and I'm, I'm really starting to understand what she's saying. Uh, basically, she's saying, right, as long as um, our sexual energy is not refined, we cannot connect, we cannot have any type of partnership in this world, right, as man and woman, and then of course, the cosmic balance is in danger because of that. So this whole time we've been talking about the refinement of sexual energy, both for male and female, by the way, right? This isn't just about males anymore. Uh, so the silence is for both of us and patients. And so back to the letting be, right? This notion of um, allowing the person to go on their journey um, while still loving them. This is the tension. Did I mention that last time? That there is a tension between letting go and holding. It's not just a letting go. Nowadays, right, we have two ways of doing this. Either I, be, I possess you and I make your life hell because I'm possessing you. I'm looking at your phone. I'm, you know, asking you where you were last night. I'm, you know, I have, how do you track people on their phones now? Y'all can do that, right? You track them on their phone. I had a say, same guy who put a, a gun to, to my friend's head because um, she was in the car with another guy. This guy told her, I'm going to put a tracker on your car <laughs> so I know where you are at all times, right? So that's one way. Right, which we and then the other way is like you know what the hell with you? We're done here, right? We let when we see somebody trying to find themselves and it's not working with us, this journey that they're trying to do, we just let them go for real. <laughs> letting be is different. Letting be is a middle way. Letting be is I'm with you and at the same time I release you. It's, it's the tension between these two urges you will have, right? We have both urges. Either I try to possess you and make it happen and you have to do this, or I just, you know, what the hell with you go? I don't care about you anymore, right? The tension between the two is the key. How, and this is the where we need the most courage and the most uh, strength is to, to both hold, I'm with you, I'm on your side, but at the same time, I can allow you within the context of this relationship to explore yourself and do what you need to do. Um, I can let you go, right? Um, so that's, that's the difficulty, right? And so she says here, right, uh, there's an interesting quote on page uh, 59, um, where she talks about traditional morality. Last paragraph on 59. When it comes to, you know, this letting be that we just talked about last time, traditional morality would be, uh, will be of little use to us here. It does not teach us how to let the other follow his or her own path, meet with whomever he or she desires, go where he or she wants. Traditional morality is saying to you, they're yours, <laughs> right? Traditional morality is basically the morality of possession. You're married to them, now that's it, end of story. You, they become your possession. And you, and you say, you know, you're my wife. You're my husband. You can't do this, right? And she's saying, well, we need to, we need to blow some oxygen in marriage if we're going to be able to continue and practice this 
you know, uh, expression, right? Uh, so remember, she, so she's, she's still talking of marriage, right? Or she's still talking of, I think she doesn't use the, yeah, she uses the word wedding, marriage, right? But it's a completely different way, right? By marriage, she doesn't mean, okay, there's a contract and now you're mine, they're his, and you, you have no more choice, you have fixed roles and so forth. She's saying, no, we need to breathe some air and oxygen and, and into this marriage and let it be a marriage where I don't have to be yours and a marriage where you are not mine. It's a completely different thing because when we marry, how we say this? Um, what are the vows? I'm sure there's something about possession in this. Anybody remember the vows? Uh, to hold and to Till cherish. Death to Till death to a spart. To, to hold. I like the holding, right? So kind of there's, um, I'm sure. I'm sure it's there somewhere. <laughs> right? In general, when we get married, we're like, you're mine now. <laughs> you don't belong to all these people, right? So here she's saying, well, we have to be able to hold while at the same time release. We need to be able to have these two going on at the same time. Yes. I was going to say the moon was like, do you take this person? Ah, thank you. Thank you. You got it. Okay. Do you take this person? Take. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's like you're taking. It's like, are you serious? So our all traditional concept of marriage is, there, is, is, is based on possession, right? And what she's saying here is that we need to revamp marriage if we're going to continue to, to have this in our culture right and this is how we can revamp it like let this marriage be a, a marriage where there is room for the other to grow and to change and to journey and to evolve and they're not stuck why are people stuck it's not you it's 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 your expectations that's put them in a stuck position right avila go ahead um, would you speak of marriage or in any conversation yeah friendship? Absolutely, anything, right? So of course she's dealing here with the specific male-female, right? So she's, and in that context, the, the closest uh, connection is that of a, a wedding or marriage, but she says that we can't see it. It doesn't matter. We shouldn't see it as possession. We should see it as, basically what, the way I, I would put it is like this. Um, it's the difference between, it's kind of like this. The marriage she's talking about, right, is, is saying that the other is simply there, you are in their life to help them grow, right? It, it's a kind of gardening metaphor that I could use there. In other words, they're here not so that they can sit there on your windowsill and make you happy. They're here so you can tend to them and create conditions of possibilities for them to grow. So if you're now just constantly keeping them from growing this is not a proper marriage right marriage is there so that we can both have the best earth right marriage is the earth of our becoming or marriage is the soil of our becoming marriage is supposed to help us become right if you're not becoming in a marriage if you're stuck you your, your marriage is it has issues right that's the idea she talks about this becoming here on page 61 it's very interesting to see marriage as a becoming and not as a final state right uh, look at this, la, uh, the only paragraph. Between the two is thus preserved the becoming that is still to be elaborated. You know how we say, I, I know this is like a block for many to get married. They say, I don't know who I'll be in 10 years. And I don't know who she'll be or he'll be in 10 years. So I'm worried. I don't want to commit to someone when I don't know who they will be in 10 years. She's saying here, they can be whoever the hell they want to be in 10 years. Doesn't mean you can't be with them, right? Because marriage is a becoming. You're both becoming. They're changing, so are you. And, and marriage is supposed to be like a, a pot, right, with earth. And you're supposed to be, it is supposed to be nurturing our becoming. It's never supposed to be, that's it, here we are. We're always going to be like that. No, there has to be a room for becoming. Um, I'll give you an image. Um, it's a motorcycle image. Anybody ride motorcycles? <laughs> okay, nobody? All right, if, I'll just tell you then. If you're on a motorcycle sitting in the back, right, of the person uh, riding, you know that when the motorcycle is turning at a high speed, what does it have to do? It has to lean in, right? Otherwise, <laughs> so it has to, lean. now if you're in the back seat and you're not leaning with the person in the front, what's going to happen to that motorcycle? It's going to, it's just going to crash. You have to lean in with the, with your partner for the motorcycle to take the turn. This is what we need to teach people who are about to get married. When there is a turn, learn to lean in. Don't be rigid. Don't sit there and say, no, I'm not going to take that turn because you're going to crash the marriage. Take the damn turn. <laughs> lean in and it's okay. You're not going to die first. That's what she's saying. We need to have marriages where there is room for becoming. Right? Yes. 
I, uh, I just wanted to say that as soon as you said that, I found it really cool because before my boyfriend and I got together and we met like eight years ago and we did not get together before we both understood that in 20 years, 10 years, five years, we are both going to change. And if we couldn't understand that with each other, then there's no point to be with each other. Okay. So then once we understood that, that's when we're okay to like keep this going. Exactly. And it's, it's really cool because that's something you have to know to be able to be in a relationship that they are always going to change. Yeah. And are you ready, right? For that adventure or challenge, right? Yeah. And and many people, they, they want things to stay the same. I mean, there was a couple I knew it was heartbreaking because the woman was extremely intelligent and she wanted to pursue PhD in medicine. And the, and the guy was like, why? <laughs> and he wouldn't let her because he's like, no, you know, it's too much money, whatever. So this is keeping the becoming. This marriage is in danger, right? When you start to do that, you have to, the marriage is there to nurture the becoming of both partners. And if, if, and, and for that, you need to both hold and let go. That's the way you nurture the becoming by both holding. I'm there for you. I don't necessarily understand what you're doing right now, but I support you. I trust you. And then you see where it goes, right? Avila, you have a question? Um, so the wording is fine as long as in the relationship that you go, because you said um, my husband and my wife, so they mine is fine. <laughs> no, that's a really good point. I think Eric Rai would, would probably, if she was writing more, right, she would say, we need to even change that, not use the word my. You know, um, say, I don't know, she hasn't spoken about it, but she, you're right. Like, that's where she's going. We need to change the language so we can change the mentality. So instead of saying my wife, you could, wife, let's help me. What, what could we say? Or my husband, what could we say instead of that? <laughs> it's kind of hard, right? The woman that is in my life or the man that is in my, you know what I mean? There's a way, the woman that is momentarily, no, the woman, <laughs> right? There's a way. She, she would go in that direction. She has done this, talked about the way we say I love you. I, I'll give you a few. Um, I, I'll, I'll t let me tell you that one because you'll like that. And then I'll get to your question. She says that in French, right? Let me, let me write it down because it's very interesting. Um, okay. In French, anybody know how to say I love you in French? You know this, right? Oui, oui. Nobody knows? Yes, Nasir? <laughs> Who knows? You don't know this? You don't know this in high school? Je t'aime. Je t'aime. Joe is I, right? M is love. And then this is the T apostrophe, which represents the U. Now, you the you, how are you feeling in that sentence? <laughs> how is the you in that sentence? Is it breathing? Does it have space? It's really trapped, right? Here's a Je, here's the M, and then <laughs> it's like a big hug, you know, from your grandma that you can't breathe, okay? So she's saying, the way this is written is messed up. <laughs> it's smothering. We need to write like that. Je, à, toi. So je, right? I love, to, which is the title of one of her works. Right? So now, how is the you, how is the I? It's interesting. Notice where they are in the sentence. The I is here, where is the you? Way over here, space, right? You see, so she's saying, even in the language, we are speaking like this, and we are acting like this. Je t'aime, and you're mine, and don't you go doing this, and don't you go doing that, you're mine. And the two is, right? So she's saying, we have to change the language to change the mentality. So Abila, she would like what you're saying right now, because she would agree, she'd be like, okay, we need to change this my business and find another way, right? The woman by my side, <laughs> the man of the house. I don't know, right? So... Um, I, I agree with you. She hasn't talked about it, so we haven't thought about it, but that's, that's the right direction. You're headed in the right direction. So it would yeah, yeah, it would never be a my. You would have to change it. When it comes to people, you can't use possessive pronouns. It's different, unless you want to see the animal like a thou, right? In the Buberian sense, then, then. So yeah, she would, I think it's interesting what you're saying, because we would need to formulate new pronouns that aren't possessive. <laughs> we, we would need to really broaden the language to allow for this new way of relating, which is not based on possession. And we would might need to invent words, like we've been doing, for example, for the whole LGBT community is invention of words, right? Because it's a new reality. So if we want to create a new reality, we need new words. So perhaps you will be the, the pioneer <laughs> in the creation of new personal pronouns <laughs> that aren't possessive, right? I like that. Okay, where was I? <laughs>
Okay, yes, yes, yes. All right, so we got that. All right, let's go to today's, which is moving boundaries. And I'm intrigued. How did I talk so much and get so little done? Uh, it's like, I have like really two important things to say still. Okay, the moving boundaries is, is I want to hear you guys on that because <laughs> I am myself struggling with that. I tend to have pretty rigid boundaries. Like this is who I am. <laughs> and please respect that, right? So I was very intrigued when I first saw her notion of moving boundaries. So it's a boundary that's like moving, right? So it can come this way, come that way, kind of like the a shore, right, of the water. So let's read that on page 57. Um, okay. Last paragraph, right in the middle, the opening to the other. Are you there? Actually, let me read from the top. No, let me not. Yeah, let me, let me not. Uh, everybody with me? The opening to the other? Okay. The opening to the other, the encounter with him or her, and the return to oneself continually produce moving boundaries, which provide a border for energy and allow it to blossom according to a living order. She continues, there are thus no longer limits imposed from an outside, formally abstracted from the present, but a being in relation that requires at every moment a restrained flowering for each one. Okay, anybody can tell me what does she mean by moving boundaries? So we, we need boundaries when we're talking with people. We need a threshold when we're in relationship. But why, what does it mean moving? <laughs> anybody have any answers? Poetry, right? So how is this hitting you? What, what, what things is it evoking for you in your mind? Hmm? Just like you have like certain boundaries, like you have like set rules and standards of how things should be like in a relationship that yeah, it, it's interesting because there's two worlds, right? Therefore, two moralities, basically. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard because you come from, imagine, let's, let's take your scenario. May I, may I use you as a pawn right now? <laughs> You're Jewish, right? Suppose you start dating uh, Ramos, who is Spanish. Sorry, I know you. <laughs> I know you're taken, whatever, right? Now, Ramos has a, she's from the Spanish world, Totally different morality from the Jewish world, right? What are you guys going to do? Tell me, <laughs> right? You have certain <laughs> rules on dating. Are you, you, kind of like are you willing to compromise? The, here are the rules. And let me tell you right now. The, I'll, 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 I'm curious. <laughs> Let's do an experiment. Rules of dating in the Jewish world. No touching. Maybe not you so bad, but in general. Right? Let's imagine you're orthodox, right? No touching. No sleeping, obviously. You cannot see, uh, I, I think, to, together without other people, or you can do that. You have to be in a public so space, much. right? Never alone in a room, whatever. So it's very strict. Now, Spanish is different. How is their morality in Spanish? It's very, like, very close space. Like, you could do what you want. Do what you want, except like, if you get her pregnant, you marry her. Yeah, I think that's the limit yeah. over there, right? Yeah, <laughs> Y'all is like, free for all till the baby comes, then you better get married and take care of that baby, right? So that's what I've noticed. In the Spanish world, it's pretty free. There's no, you know, you can touch, you can have sex, you can do all those things, but don't be careful if the baby comes, you better damn well get married in a church, right? So now here you are dating. How are you going to do this? <laughs> right? These are religious rules, right? So it's difficult for you to compromise. You're like, how are we going to get to know each other? Like, what the hell? You know? So how would you do that? Let, let me see how it would work. I'm curious. The Weiselberg Ramos couple. How would they work it out? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think you know that Siri tell us. <laughs> huh? <laughs> what you say? It's a FaceTime. <laughs> but I think the way that I grew up because of my family and how we work is that we are very closely together, touch a lot. Like, this is just who we are. Yeah, so, like, so I feel like... I'm like a Jewish person. It doesn't... Like, it might not be promoting, like, physical closeness, but like, it then forces you to, like, Ah, like, oh, you could explain. You could explain. And look, Ramos is agreeing. <laughs> That's interesting. Did you see what just happened? This is brilliant. Wow. No, no, sounding romantic. Positively romantic. <laughs> Very nice. Okay, you see what just happened? He didn't just say, no, 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 it's against my religion. Right? He explained. I like that. Because you explained, and you gave an argument that was compelling to Ramos, right? Now, Ramos is like, ooh, I want this, <laughs> right? Exactly. So this is how, right, the mistake we make sometimes is we enter the relationship and we, like, uh, she talks about despotism, we impose. This is how I am. This is my culture. 
I can't do this. And then the other is going to be like, well, the hell with you then, because you're not acknowledging me at all. But if you start to say, well, this is for us, like this is for you. I want to be more romantic. And for me, words go deeper than um, touching and touching will get even more intense if we allow for words first. And now you have literally seduced that person, right? So that's the idea is learning to communicate your boundaries in a way that the other person understands that it's for them that you're doing this or it's for the sake of the relationship that you're doing this right so it's it's always if you and we'll talk more about that in double listening in a bit and you guys really did great with the double listening just now right you said something he said something you were convinced it was amazing like that was great that was great okay so that's i think that's the idea the moving boundaries is like now you're willing to maybe wait a little bit before touching because you have been like oh i can move my boundary a little bit because he makes sense right and so forth and so at the contact of the other you, you it doesn't mean you follow blindly what the other is saying you can allow yourself to be moved by the other moved in the sense of i'm you know i'm convinced i'm seduced by what you're saying and now you can shift your boundary so it's it's a kind of um you have the boundary but you can you're in charge of that boundary <laughs> right how it's gonna be placed okay very nice so that's the idea let's read a little bit here what, what, she, what she says uh, a little bit more uh, on the top of that paragraph, same paragraph, page 57. Um, oh, first of all, no limits imposed from an outside. Uh, this is very important. So what she's saying here is that ultimately, yes, we have limits from our religion or culture, right? We have certain boundaries that our culture has taught us, our religion has taught us, but ultimately she says, the ultimate authority should always be the face of the other. This is pure Levinas, right? The, the final law, right, that you need to follow, the highest authority is not what your culture teaches, is the other. Because what the culture is teaching is for the sake of the other. <laughs> so if you use the culture to destroy the other, you're not doing the right thing with the culture, right? So the ultimate authority, ultimately who you listen to, the ultimate is, uh, source of the limits that you place on yourself, is the other person so actually it's interesting because moving boundaries i just realized something as i'm talking it's not so much about protecting your boundary than about protecting theirs right when you're thinking i'm gonna listen to you and you're gonna tell me how far you want to go you're protecting their boundary right and so and so what she's saying basically is that we need a new morality we know that and she's saying, let's leave behind the abstract, you know, religious uh, or traditional laws, because those are not working anymore in a context. I don't know if I agree with her, but certainly if you're dating someone from a different faith, it's not as easy to maintain those structures, right? So then she says, ultimately, you want to get your, your feedback from the person you're talking to. They are the ultimate authority. This is the difference between people-based ethics and principle-based ethics. And Levinas is the one, of course, who paved the way to this, right? So make sure you write this down. This is the difference between people-based ethics and principle-based ethics. You don't gain your guidance from principles anymore in the 21st century. You gain it from the face of the other. So she's speaking Levinas here, right? This is, this is definitely alluding back to Levinas. Okay, so that was nice. I like that. Um, let's read the, the, the top of that paragraph. To be sure, this energy needs limits. But instead of being imposed as definite forms, even forms presumed to be ideal, these limits henceforth exist as the blossoming of the life of each one. Here's the idea that the relations with the other prevent from proliferating an anarchic, intrusive, or despotic ways, right? So that's the same idea, the moving boundaries so that you don't impose your boundary on the other. You have what we just witnessed between Ramos and Weiselberg. That was really nice. Thank you, guys. That helped me. <laughs> Actually helped me. Great. That was great. That was, that was really nice. That was an I you moment right there. Like that was very powerful, actually. I, I really, and I got to see your faces. So it was even more interesting um, for me at least. Okay, let's go to double listening. This is my favorite. This is, um, I think this is very, very uh, important. Let's read the quote for that, page 11. This is important, especially um, to the type of personality that is a pleasing type of personality. How many pleasers in the room? Any pleasers? Are you I'm sort of a pleaser, it depends. <laughs> One, two, three, pleaser, Jordan? Sort of, okay, good. Um, so we'll see how, how this works here. Uh, okay, page 11, last paragraph. 
Interesting. Where? Okay, I'll just let me. Sorry. Um, page eleven. Now I want page fifteen. Okay, page fifteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Second paragraph. So now we're talking about the kind of, so we talked about silence, patience, moving boundaries, double listening is the last step of refinement. Here we are. In fact, when come, what comes to face, what comes to face a speaking subject is another subject. Not only the horizon of a world that has been projected from, skipping, 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 uh, from what faces us, another language speaks to us from beyond the world that we have appropriated, this stuff we know already. Now here's the key. We need to listen to it without relinquishing the discourse that is already ours. We need to listen without submitting ourselves or the other to a unique saying. So what is double listening? What are you gathering from this quote? Um, what is the definition of double listening? I was reading that you know, like she meant like, um, like listening to the other, but also listening to the way I'm responding to the other. Mm -hmm, absolutely, right? The other has a wisdom. That's the first, that's what we've been learning throughout the whole class, right? The other has a wisdom, we need to listen to the other, the other opens us up, the other helps us grow, the other, right, challenges us so we can mature. But what about me? Well, you have a wisdom too, <laughs> right? This is the first time we hear about the self in this class, apart from Kant. Kant also said that, we have to respect ourselves, right? This is the same thing. When you're listening, you listen to what they have to say, you listen to their wisdom, but you're also in tune with your wisdom. Right. And, and so I want to, uh, I want to dwell on that a little bit because of, of what I've noticed. Um, so what I've noticed in many of my students when, when they're dating um, and in myself too, uh, to be honest, we often don't want to listen to ourselves, right. When we are in a relationship, because we have two fears. One, we don't want to appear uptight. So we want to go along, right. We don't want to say no. Because we're like, we don't want to look like we're uptight or, you know, not chill or whatever. And two, right, we don't want to appear selfish, <laughs> right? So the other wants to do something. You don't want to do it, but you're afraid to say no because you're like, if I say no, I'm going to look like, you know, I'm either uptight or selfish and I don't want to be selfish. So I'm just going to go along even though I don't really want that, right? So there's so many ways we do this, right? And then you go along. And you're not in it because you're not happy with it, but you're trying to be happy with it. And in the end, it backfires and it creates a lot of trouble in the relationship, actually. <laughs> relationship starts to have problems because you have gone along with this thing. I, I gave you the example of my student, hopefully she won't listen to this, um, who was dating somebody. Did I tell you about um, the, the girl who was dating somebody and then um, he kind of just disappeared, um, right? And in the beginning of the relationship, she, you know, she wanted to take it slow but then she still wanted to look relaxed. So she sacrificed her wisdom to take it slow and they rushed into it. And then he was, didn't know who he was, what he wanted. So he was with her without being with her. <laughs> and this created a lot of stress in her. And then it started to disintegrate the relationship because she didn't listen to her. It's not his fault. I am not even blaming him right now. <laughs> I'm not even blaming this man, right? Because she's the one who knew what to do and she didn't listen to herself. And so then he was there all wishy-washy and she got hurt and traumatized and then it got bad, right? So very often what we need to realize, I think, and this is especially true of women, I think we tend to be more, you know, doormatty. Um, it, it's very important, I think, to realize that our voice is wisdom, right? That our voice is actually there to help build the relationship. Our voice, our wisdom that we're often neglecting for the sake of the other actually is there to build the relationship. There's such a beautiful poem by Rumi that I just came across uh, on the internet. Um, and it says this, um, you think you're the lock, but you are actually the door or the key. You're actually the key. Or you think you're trouble, but you're actually the remedy. Something like that. And then he talks about everyone's specific beauty. So very often you think that your wisdom is going to create trouble, is going to create obstacles, is going to create extra hassles, and you don't want to say no in these particular moments. But what we're not realizing is that no is the safeguard of the relationship. <laughs> Very often that no can actually protect, there is actually a type of wisdom that can safeguard the relationship. And to not hear your own no and to not be able to say it, very often the relationship suffers. Not, not just, of course you suffer, 
but the other also suffers, right? And the example, if my friend had listened to herself, she would probably still be great friends with that guy right now, or maybe they would be dating at a proper pace, right? So that's the idea, to realize that my no is wise, right? My no is on the side of love, right? My no is on our side. My no is for you, <laughs> not about me. It's about us. This is why I want to say no here. Are you following me on that? Yeah. So, so important, right? This double listening. Of course, we listen to the other, like you guys did. That was great. But also, right, you were very in tune with yourself, right? You heard her, like, you know, she told you, oh, we're very, you know, cuddly, whatever. And you said, yeah, I understand that you want proximity. You understood exactly what she was saying. I understand you want closeness, but words can bring that closeness even more powerful. And now you were like, oh, he got me, he got me. And he opened up a new way to be close, right? So that was a great example of double listening. You heard exactly what she said. And then you spoke for her. Not the, it wasn't about protecting yourself. It wasn't about keeping your law, right? It was about how can I, how, uh, it was about for you, let's do this, right? And you were like, and you, 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 you got the bit. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, great, uh, let's see. Yes, let's read one last quote and then we can call it a day. Um, page 33. Okay, third, third paragraph. Any mutation involves a sort of death. And the risk is greater yet when it is a matter of sharing that calls into question the whole self that interrupts the way itself. No doubt this way will have to be uh, again taken. Now here's the quote. But without a radical questioning of one solitary journey, meeting with the other is impossible. So if you can't hear what they're saying and nuance, right? Part of your own uh, system, right? It's not going to work. Nevertheless, she says, it is important to remain faithful to one's own journey. So that, so you see the two tensions. There's two tensions in the text. Number one, we saw last time, to hold and let be, to hold and let go at the same time. And now it's this, to be open and closed at the same time, to be open to her journey and faithful to my journey. The, it, it's always the, the, the best path is always the path of the tension between this and that. And can I juggle both? Can I bring both together? And now you have something. So that's the challenge, right? How can I both listen to you and listen to myself? How can I both respect what you're saying and respect my own journey? And I think we had a beautiful example of how it's possible, right? So really nice. Well done, guys. Okay. We are done with the regret. Any questions or concerns or anything that you've been wanting to figure out through these last few weeks or right now on what we study? Okay, cool. All right, so next time we have um, the thing, the discussion. Let me stop this recording.